It is reminded that there is no teaching here. But by way of stories, we've been exploring the nature of divine psychology, like the explorations we've done over these many years. But it's suggested that we cannot know divine psychology until we've learned the ways of existence, the laws of existence, and the chemistry of existence. In other words, to become divine scientists, physicists, and alchemists. There are several old stories as we continue with our exploration into divine psychology to do with the psyche we know. What is this psyche? Is it to do with mind? Is it to do with consciousness? But that's to explore for another day. In the meantime, there's a story about the seeker after truth who decided that he would search for the greatest teacher in the world, believing that this would bring for him the way to learn truth. So he set out on his journey, and every way he went, he inquired as to the possibility of there being the greatest teacher in the world where he was. But then one day he happened to meet a, a wise man who said, the greatest teacher in the world is Bahudin el-Din, and he lives in Isfahan. So our seeker after truth immediately set out for Isfahan. And when he arrived there, he asked everyone he meant, do you know Bahadun al-Din? And finally, he came upon someone in the street who pointed out to him a young man walking on the other side of the road obviously on his way to a place of learning. So our seeker hurried over to this young man and said, Are you Bahadun Neldin? And the young man replied, Yes, I am. And so the seeker said, Well, are you the greatest teacher in the world? And the young man answered, I am unable to answer your question at this time. And so the seeker after truth said, then I have no truck with you. And 30 years passed, during which time our seeker after truth went from place to place, continuing in his search for truth. But then one day, in another far-off land, as our seeker was walking down the road, coming towards him in the other way, was a stately figure, followed by an entourage of beings. And this stately figure approached our seeker, accosted him in the street and said, three decades ago you asked me a question and now I am ready to give you the answer. Of course, no answer was needed, our seeker 
took his place amongst those who were following this stately being. And the second story is of that very wealthy merchant. He had ships that plied the trade throughout the oceans of the world. He had warehouses full of goods. He was treated as nobility by kings and nobles around the world because of his great wealth. But then destiny took a hand and pirates invaded his ships on the ocean. Marauders came into his land and took his goods and burned his warehouses. His servants deserted him. He was left penurious, destitute. All he was left to do was wander aimlessly. But remembering that one of his mentors was the king of Spain, he decided to make his way to this land to seek the aid of this great king. But to arrive there, he had to cross a vast desert. And in crossing the desert, he was taken by bandits, enslaved and sold into slavery. His life was very hard until he managed to escape from this fate. But then again he wandered seemingly aimlessly from place to place, almost being a beggar. His face was burned by the sun. He became rough in his speech until finally he reached the shores of great land of Spain. But there, when he attempted to go to meet his mentor, the king of Spain, the guards turned him away. How could such a rough, uncultured peasant be allowed into the presence of the king? So he was forced to become a porter, to carry people's goods, to earn enough money to buy himself some decent clothing. But even then, when clad in clothes that were acceptable, when he came upon the guards of the palace, his rough speech and his rough manner could not allow him entry. But he was able to attain for himself a place in the kitchens of the palace where, almost you could say by osmosis, he learned the protocols, the ways of nobility. And finally, finally, he was found to be acceptable to go in to the king's presence. When he did, very surprisingly, the king recognized him straight away and asked him how it went with him. And he told his litany the sad experiences of loss the privations, the hardships of what had happened after. And immediately the king called his courtier to him and he said to them, 
give this man one hundred sheep and let him be a shepherd. Now, our merchant was somewhat disappointed at this gift. He was not a shepherd. He did not know the ways of being a shepherd and had no interest in becoming a shepherd. But with his hundred sheep, he went up to the mountainside. But it wasn't very long before his sheep were attacked by a group of wild wolves and those that weren't destroyed were driven to the edge of a cliff and went over. So he went back to the king and when asked again he had to relate how the sheep had been lost. And the king called his courtier again and said, give this man 50 sheep. And so taking his 50 sheep, our merchant went back to pasture. But somehow his sheep did not flourish. They didn't produce lambs. And soon, all 50 had died off. Again, our merchant went to the king, and the king instructed, give this man 25 sheep. So taking his 25 sheep, he went back to pasture. But... Somehow, the sheep flourished. They produced lambs. He was able to trade them in the marketplace, and he found that by crossbreeding the sheep, sheep he had a very hardy flock. And so he prospered. He was able to build a fine house. Acquire fine clothing. And so he was able to go to the king and relate, now resplendent, wealthy once again. When he came face to face with the king, the king said, It so happens that the great land of Seville is now requiring a leader, a ruler. And so I designate you to become the new monarch of this great land. The merchant could not help himself out of his mouth, he, he, he said, but, 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 but why was it that you did not give this to me when I first arrived? And the king said, let us just say that if this had been given to you when you were given the hundred sheep, there would not be a stern standing in the great land of Seville. Now, the question that arises from these stories is not what is their deep meaning. The question that arises from these stories is, what do time and timing, which is the essence of these stories, 
relative to our exploration, our inquiry into the nature of divine psychology. Look to our own experiences, our own life experiences, and we each have a story or stories. Time and timing. How do they relate to divine psychology? Can we match our stories? Whatever we might have called them, synchronicities, etc., that give us a gleaning, an insight, a flowering of knowing, and ultimately, an acceptance of being a divine psychologist. Time and timing. Divine psychology. Look to your stories. Look to our stories. And begin to claim being a divine psychologist. <laughs> 